This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. Uh, we are here in a COVID-19 edition of the podcast, but in a person, safely socially distancing for uh, an in-person conversation here in Denver, Colorado with Stephen Kirby, the founder of Hogshead Brewery here in Denver. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thank you very much. If Good you, to be here. If you read the magazine uh, a few years ago, you may have seen we uh, we did a feature package on brewing cask ales, and uh, there was a nice big full page picture of Stephen uh, pouring cask ales here out of the the tap room at Hogshead. We are going to spend this episode talking to Stephen about uh, brewing British style beers, brewing cask ales, the you know ingredients secret process secrets, and we're going to pick his brain for uh, for his brewing knowledge around that. Before we do that. Nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. Innovative modular designs and no proprietary parts can propel G&D ahead as the premier choice for your glycol chilling needs. Breweries you recognize, like Russian River, Ninkasi, Jack's Abbey, Samuel Adams, and more, trust G&D to chill the beer you love. Call G&D Chillers to discuss your project today or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by HS1228 Hops, third in the new BSG Hops Solution Portfolio HS1228 takes you all the way to the heart of the West Coast. HS1228 is bursting with pronounced tropical fruit like mango, pineapple, citrus, and pine characteristics that bring out a classic West Coast hop character. Designed for late kettle or dry hop for various hop forward styles. Learn more about BSG Hop Solutions online and look for more BSG Hop Solutions releases coming soon. Stephen Kirby. Talk to me about uh, how you entered the world of brewing, what it was, what that moment was for you that said, hey, I want to do this, and uh, and then how you progressed to where you are here in Denver, Colorado, running uh, a brewery, Hogshead, making British-style beers, making cask ales, and serving them to uh, you know thirsty beer nerds or beer fans here in Colorado. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll, t- I'll talk a little bit about Carl Scale first because uh, this is a, a story I've told many times. I must have been about nine or ten, and my best friend's dad used to buy a kilderkin of Young's Special Bitter, and it used to live by the front door over Christmas, and the adults used to get tucked in. And I can always remember me, Frankie, and Colin standing around this, and we decided, well, no one can see in it. So, so we decided to pour ourselves some beer. Um, so I credit uh, Frank's dad with my love of car scale. Um, I also grew up in that tenuous period in in the um, UK where uh, the Allied Six, as they were called, um, were buying everybody, and um, small cask breweries were going out of going out of fashion because they told us that you know we'd love this new fangled beer called keg beer but we didn't so that's when camera right. was founded and uh so i i was of that age you know i mean when you were in the uk back in the day if you was a big lumpy kid and you could go to a country pub and go like three pints are better please harry you might get them or you might get a smack around the ear <laughs> um so you know you, you started drinking and also you used to go down the pub with your dad on the weekend and he'd buy you you know you start out with half a shandy and then you go like progress to a bitter top mostly beer with half an inch of lemonade on the top and you know so I was always in that version of like cast beer, beer was the real thing my older brother incidentally was a dedicate, dedicated keg man because he <laughs> well because he bought he was you know yeah, eight years yeah. older than i and he grew up in that whole thing um of like you know these weird adverts from you know whip bread trophy bitter the pint that thinks it's a quart kind of stuff you know so 
um, from that's the, how the family loyalties align. It's uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, so I was just a I was a desic, designated you know cast condition beer, and there were only really two cast condition beers in London at that point. Youngs, of course, down in Wandsworth before Charles Wells bought them and moved them to Bedfordshire, and uh, Fuller's out of Chiswick, now owned by. I don't know, Asahi or Sapporo or yeah. somebody. Um, so, you know, if you live right, south, right. south of the river, you drank Young's. And if you went across the river yeah. or West London, you drank Fuller's. And that was, that's what you drank. And, and, you know, your dad told you and your granddad told you beer doesn't travel. So to have a pint of beer from Manchester in London. Right. No, you went to Manchester and drank, you know, Robinson's. Sure, or, sure. So as large as it was, it was still local, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I mean, you know, I talked to Bill I quite a bit, and he's saying, like, you know, the same thing, you know, is in Germany. I mean, you right, know, right. A, a brewery serves a community, and that's really kind yeah. of like what's happened at Hogshead. I mean, it's, it acts like a small British pub. Right. Um, you know, this is a community-driven deal. So you grew up drinking the, you know, drinking uh, Cascale. Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like sort of like child abuse. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it, I, I, in America, we have different puritanical yeah, ideals for these kinds of no, things. And the, the concept of that, even though, uh, you know, there are states like Wisconsin where any parent can legally serve a child of any age, you know, we tend to be a little more, um, uh, pu- yeah, puritanical, I think was the right word for that. Um, how did you decide to go from being a craft beer or a, a Cascale consumer who uh, to entering the craft beer world and becoming a brewer? Well, you know there was a there was a period in the United Kingdom where you couldn't buy a job. You know, I mean Maggie, right. Maggie Thatcher came along, sure, and all, all sure. of a sudden there were four million people out of work. I was, uh, you know, out of luck. Yeah. Um, so I just sort of started knocking on doors. I worked for a couple of small, well, actually, first of all, I started doing the cellar at a, a very a famous pub called uh, The Stag. We used to keep 12 real owls, and I used to do the cellar, and I used to work with this guy, Leo McKern, um, and he got me a job with a now, now defunct brewery called Raven, um, every brewery in the UK, I mean, there's been, so, it's kind yeah, of like, yeah. you know, you adopted what happened in the UK in the 70s, you came here in the 90s and, you know, the big guys are still here and there's so many breweries that yeah. came and went. So, I, you know, um, and then uh, part of that Allied Six, Phoenix, Whitbread were in Brighton at that point. I was living in Brighton on the south coast and, you know, I got a job moving kegs, stacking kegs, in anything I was trying to be in a brewery but it right. was really difficult to be in the brew business in the UK at that point it was more it was more like an apprenticeship it was like turn up at five o'clock in yeah. the morning get wet and don't moan <laughs> and maybe we'll, maybe we'll let you come back tomorrow kind of deal there's quite a few of those going on in craft uh, brewing right now in America too so I think yeah, uh, people, uh, people I said, are familiar with that yeah, it seems to have made it a resurgence of, you yeah. know yeah. Unfortunately, um, um, in the terms of professional development, so you started kind of doing what you could and trying to get in. Um, what was your first real serious, you know, brewing job? And then uh, how did you kind of progress through that? Uh, that was at the Raven Brewery. Okay. Um, I mean, I just like I said. I mean, I was the. How many years did you put in there? Uh, about three or four. Yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, I was the general dog's body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when Jake first started with me, I, he had business cards that says, uh, you know, General Dog's Body. And he said to me, what does that mean? I said, well, you do everything I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake, uh, for people that aren't familiar, that is uh, head brewer at Westbound and Down. He now. is now, yeah. Right, He's right. doing a fantastic job. So from Raven, where did you where'd you go? And uh, what's the, you know, the quick arc to get here at Hogshead? Uh, there was no quick arc. Okay. Um, I, ca- I came first time I came to America was about 1980 yeah I, I, that was at the fledgling end of the craft brewing industry right. you know you still pretty much had three beers here right you know you had a few other you know Sierra Nevada and sure. people like that I don't think they were started then anyway I hated all the beer here I met uh, my girlfriend at the time and we bought a house um, 
and I went back to the UK and she picked me up at the airport when I came back and she said, what, what, what's going on then? And I had three Firkins, two beer engines and we had a house on Gilpin Street, that's where the Gilpin Black Gold comes from. Uh, that bre- the, the basement there was bigger than the brewery we, we've got a hogshead. <laughs> So we dug it out to eight foot six, and that was. So we used to have, you know, these kind of Christmas parties, and I used to make car scale. Um, and you know, people would come and say, "I've never tasted anything like this." Right. And I was like, "Well, no, you wouldn't, because you'd need a passport and a pocket full of money." So that's basically how we started here. Um, I looked at. Uh, I worked at the the uh, Bristol for for a minute. Um, down in Colorado Springs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the one on Broadway here. Oh, okay. Uh, in Denver, 1023rd and Broadway, I think it was. Okay. You know, just trying to get a start, but right, it wasn't. Right. And then it was weird, weird times. And then I had some investment out of London. They said, you know, guys used to come, a good friend of mine used to come and do business here. And he was like, yeah, this beer's great. You could sell this in the UK. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um and they they fronted up some money, but in the interim t- yeah. time, uh, we decided to move to Australia. Huh. And so by the time they came back with the money, we were like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you make decisions. Sure. You know, I was about 24, I think. Um, and we moved to Australia. And then, I, you know, when I came back to the United States 12, 15, uh, how long have I been? 15 years ago, I mean, the same thing was missing what a, an English bloke would call, would call a proper pint. Right. So I just decided to saddle up and do Hogshead. Oh, uh, what, what year did you launch Hogshead? Uh, well, I had a little R&D brewery in 2010, and then I think we opened here in uh, 20, 2012. Okay. Talk to me uh, a bit about, as uh, you know, with this long history and understanding and growing up with Cascale, um, how you decided what to brew and uh and some of your uh leading beers what you wanted to focus on why you wanted to focus those well we go back to the proper pint yeah you know, i mean that's uh our ch- chimwag here is probably one of our biggest selling beers it's, yeah there's uh it's my homage to um i knew john keeling out of fuller's um he was a brewer there for i don't know 25 27 years yeah um and then Chinwag is a what, what kind of style is it? Well, mean? it's it's so Fuller's launched ESB in 1971. They yeah. own the trademark for ESB, extra special okay. bitter. And um, so I borrowed their yeast. And this is my homage to, Fuller, uh, to Fuller's ESB. It's hoppier than uh, Fuller's is. Um, it's the same strength, 5.8. Um, John Keeling came here. Uh, in 13 with we had a little beer festival here in 2013 yeah we had about eight or nine british breweries some good ones as well and john told me that's not a bad point pint that boy so i (laughs) thought i'll take that um yeah so i mean you know beer styles are just sure i think i think the truth's out really i only make three beers i mean you know you've got guys that make everything from who want to make everything right i mean i make bitter i make porter i make mild um porter slash stout yeah so what i'm interested in let's talk about each one of those um there are a lot of people that make beers they call bitter there are you know a smaller number of people that make beers they call mild and um there's a significant number of people who make beers they call porter um what let's start with esb what in your mind sums up what an ESB should be from a brewer's perspective? Well, it shouldn't be called Amber Ale for a start. Okay. I mean, if you start out making an ESB, you should have enough bollocks to see it through. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because every ESB I've drunk in this country has changed its name to it's now an Amber Ale. Yeah, just uh, because consumers don't want to buy a beer called ESB? Well, yeah, you know, if you go to any, any brewery and they have a blonde ale, you know that's the beer that nobody gives a shit about, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure, sure. <laughs> So uh, ESB, I mean, standard, classic, uh, like I said, Fuller's, Fuller's pretty much invented it. Yeah. Malt forward, should have a decent bitterness on the back end, um, easy to drink. Um, 
you know, it sounds like a you know a, a classic beer. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it's one of the great British styles. I mean, I think Americans still get confused with the idea of bitter. What uh, what kind of elements of bitterness do you shoot for? Do you define it in IBUs, or do you have a, you know a kind of a goal point for that? Yeah, I do. And is there a quality of bitterness and a kind of hop regimen that you prefer that uh, gives it a specific character of bitterness? Yeah, I mean, we. we uh I mean, we stick to a pretty tra- traditional s- schedule. I mean, 60, 45, 15. Yeah. Um, lights out, we normally give it a touch of something, not aromatic, but, um, and I stick really for the bitters. I stick to British hops. Bittering hops can mm-hmm. come from Germany, Magnum, or here, Nugget. Um, but the tradition, I mean, you know, the traditional hops, Goldings, Fuggles, Challenger, Target. Um, I mean, these are tried and tested. Right. I used them in the UK. You know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and obviously you mentioned Fuller's yeast. Is there a, a malt component to ESB that, uh, you know, and the, I, the way I want to dig in because, you know, I find especially in simple beers like this, the difference between an average beer and a great beer become really small choices on, on the part of the brewer. And so figuring out where some of those, you know, small decisions are that make big differences, you know, that that's where I want to kind of, you know, probe into on this. Yeah, I think, oh, I mean, we can try some in a minute because I'm sure all this talk and getting a bit thirsty. <laughs> um, but I think all the beers at, at Hogshead, we only have two yeasts, really, unless we borrow them in, you know, we borrow... Uh, yeast from beer start to make this collaboration beer right. that we do with them every year, the Bilsner. The Bilsner. Um, but I think you know, classically, the yeast pro- profile of Fuller's is orange marmalade, jammy, right? Um, fruit forward, and a lot of but you know, Bill, well, Bill's a good example. Is I, I used that O2 yeast for years, and I never got the complexities that you do out of that yeast yeah i'm a slight under pitcher i mean <laughs> okay. pe- people always say that's a bit weird but then yeah. I, I i tend to pitch in pretty cool let the yeast grow yeah um just to I, kind I, of favor ester production and yeah well and i think you know a lot of british yeast that came to america i mean if it says it on the packet it'll work at 72 that's where people normally start you know um yeah. i'm very much old school i mean all all the guys that i knew in the uk i mean um you know we brewed a lot of beer at rugate over the last three or four years in yorkshire yeah you know they're they're pretty cool in warm up let it do its thing and then run it you, mm. you know so you can you don't get i mean you know when you run o2 really hot it get, it gives some weird flavors i mean if you yeah. start it out hot um so i, I i'm a Cheat your dreadful, cheat like your girlfriend. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Nurse it. Okay, okay. On on the malt side, uh, where do you find yourself leaning? Uh, is that a, a you know, consistent uh, choice, or do you uh, uh, toy around with different? Uh... Well, I've known the Simpson boys for quite a few years. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rich, you know, Richard will uh, will be on this very podcast in a, a couple of weeks after this episode. Yeah, and uh, you know, Peter, bit God rest him, uh, was a a good mate yeah. um you know every time he came here it was like <laughs> you know i can remember him standing on that table over there going like yeah. this is what i'm talking about <laughs> you know uh, you, you know because he was like a you know one of the, a four three eight four two beer that he could drink eight pints of. right right um so i've used pretty much the malt profile is simpsons i've used yeah. muntons i've used um crisp uh, but predominantly it's um, Marisotta yeah um, and why do you I mean obviously I guess that's traditional and so that's your choice is there something to uh, the Simpsons that you just enjoy or is it just that relationship that does it for you well there's a lot of things but I mean they've been doing it since 1862 sure, so sure. you know when the, I do have people knock on the door tell me it's local and blah 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 but you know you want more money than the Simpsons do um, and like I said, they've been doing it since 1862. I mean, and if I got a problem, I phone somebody up and say, "What the fuck is going on here?" You know what I mean? <laughs> For sure. Um, let's uh, let's talk about uh, mild then, and uh, you know, and make that kind of pivot. Um, 
when you envision that, what is uh, what is that beer? Um, how should it present, and how do you then um, both answer tradition but make something your own in that kind of realm? Um, well, a lot of people said I'm not a very innovative brewer. That's okay by me. I mean, I look at what went on long before I got in the game. Yeah. And same thing. I mean, a, a classic pint of mild should, it's all in the name. Right, right. right. I mean, and it, sh- it, you know, it doesn't need to be a hot bum. Uh, should have some. I, I, the beer is a conduit for conversation and not a focus of its own. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the whole thing. I mean, if you look at the established brewing industries around, or people that drink a lot of beer, the Germans, right. the Brits, the beer is the social lubricant. It's the right. lubricant, you know, we don't talk about beer. I mean, right, you'll go right. down and go like, that's a great pint, but that's enough of that. And then you need sure. to talk about something else. But a yeah. mild is just one of those beers. It's almost, it's, it almost died. Uh, yeah. It was a big. It was a big beer. Nineteenth century. It, it limped into the middle half of the twentieth century. You know, in, in the Midlands and in the, in the north of England, there are still quite a few miles. It's making a resurgence. Not like, you know, <laughs> right? Not like uh, a resurgence, resurgence. But it's still a style in the UK. It's no IPA, but uh... no, and it isn't. Uh, uh, you know, an IPA in the UK is different to IPA in America sure, I mean it's sure. you know IPA is on steroids here and it suits some people and it I you know you get a lot yeah. of people come from the UK I go like I don't like that right you know um let's uh let's talk a little bit more about that in a second but first with nearly 20 years of innovation and experience Brumation specializes in electric steam and direct fire brew houses complete cellar solutions and automated controls for the craft brewing industry from half barrel to 30 barrel systems Brumation puts you in control to design a brewery that fits your needs and brewing style whether you're starting a new brewery upgrading your cellar or just need some parts to keep you up and running Brumation has you covered visit them at brumation.com to get started also born out of a basement in Milwaukee a decade ago Spike has grown to become a leading manufacturer of premium quality brewing equipment. So if you're looking for a reliable system for home or commercial grade nano for your brewery, this is the time to buy. Spike is offering craft beer and brewing listeners a special 10% off all three vessel system purchases while supplies last. Visit spikebrewing.com slash craft and enter the code CBB at checkout. Spike Brewing, pursue what's possible. You should have told me you were going to go to an ad. I could have poured us a pint at oh. that time. <laughs> Jesus. Well, we can take a quick pause so you can pour a, pour a pint then, for, for sure. sure. I yeah. will take you up on that offer. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're back now and uh, with pints in hand, and it's a, a whole different context now. Thank you, uh, Stephen. You're welcome. You mentioned a, a second ago that um, IPA is a really different thing. In, U- in the UK versus America, and you seem to have some opinions about that. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, that development of IPA and, you know, how things have diverged. And, uh, you know, from your perspective, you- you've got an IPA on the menu here uh, on cask typically. And, uh, you know, let's talk about how you make that IPA and how you uh, envision it from a more traditional perspective. Um I think that must be yeast driven really yeah um because the you know people are looking for an ak in america oh uh, sorry an ipa in america are looking for that we've got ak on the brain because we're drinking ak yeah. ordinary bitter and uh and so uh you know hence the hence the slips um i think they're mostly looking for that new world hop taste either australian or yeah american hops we try not to. I mean, I think it's a little softer. I mean, uh, when that beer uh, appears on keg, uh, the carbonic acid part of that really spikes that beer to mm. um, more of an American aspect, I think. I, yeah. mean, I, I, I mean, that's what I love about cask conditioned beers. It melds everything and rounds everything into a place I can deal with it. Um, you know I'm not saying I don't like IPA I think there's some great ones Uh, you know Comrade make one Um, Jake's making a couple up at Westbound that are great Um, I think this one's pretty good Um, but it's not really in the British profile now having said that um, you are finding some IPAs in the British market 
at lower alcohol. I mean, that, this, it, I don't know if you could, you're, you're familiar with Ron Patterson. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, Ron's, Ron, a, Ron's written for us. And yeah, Ron's an old mate of mine, and if you know anything about Ron, he'll he's got similar opinions sure. that I share. Um, IPA can be seven and a half percent. It can be bigger. Traditionally. In the UK, through the 19th and the 20th century, it, I mean, you see a lot of IPAs, and you still do. You call them session beers here, but they start at about 3.8 hmm. and go through to the sixes. Right. I mean, you, 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 you have to know that, you know, between the two world wars, um, beer lost a fair amount of its potency in, in the UK just through taxation and paying to go fight Germans. <laughs> um, you know, but then that drinkability and lower ABV and, you know, allows balance to happen. I a- think so. Um, um, and I think, you know, AK is a good example of that. I mean, yeah. um, but this is another beer you were talking about, mild. I mean, um, you know, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I only know two people really making an AK, and that's Hogshead and, and McMullins now. Um, it's a beer style that, like I said, between the First and the Second World War, everybody made an AK. Um, it was often called family beer, hmm. or, you know, it's what you gave the kids before they went to school, I think. <laughs> um it was a, a, a you know a kind of generic beer, AK. Now going back to Ron, people ask me all the time, is it about a rifle? No, it's about it, supposedly the the one I think I prefer is that AK came with uh, the Flemish when they came into the east coast of England to drain the Fen lands. Uh, they also brought the hop. We're talking 1600s late 1500s early 1600s mm-hmm. um and apparently uh because ron lives in amsterdam right right uh, in flemish a uh, ale kite means small beer so this is the version of ak that we prefer rather than you know four x's and triple x and but ak was when it was branded on barrels normally denoted it was a running beer not a keeping beer of you know sub four percent right right i mentioned how tight your parameters are on this again you know when we start talking about small beers the the small decisions you know and the small things have bigger impacts it's the same way with pilsner it's the same way with you know all my, these delicate beers you know with a beer like ak and, and this kind of bitter at uh, you know in the low four percent range um that kind of extra body and sweetness at or perception of that in uh in a small beer does help give it this kind of big rich feel talk to me you know for which is something you know as i'm drinking it now it feels full in the mouth it feels like it has a solid body to it um you know it's not a highly dry beer um how do you construct that overall picture of uh a small beer that feels bigger than it is. I think that's what the Brits do better than anybody in the, else in the world. And that, I think, designing a beer to add CO2, or as we say here, a, natural, <laughs> a naturally carbonated beer. Yeah. Um, when you take a 4% beer and you cast condition that beer, it will give it a mouthfeel which will satiate the palate and make you think you're drinking a, drinking a bigger beer than you are. And I think that's, you know, brewing beer to go in a cask is different for me than brewing beer to go in a keg. We have, we have experimented with AK as a keg beer. For me, it doesn't work at all. And, and mm. I, I will say that again about mild. I mean, when you've got a 3.8 or 4% beer, cask conditioning is everything. Um, and I think it's the bigger part of the. It, it's almost it's almost as big as brewing the beer is doing the cellar work. Yeah. So from your perspective, what if, like from a sensory perspective, um, and from a brewing perspective, how would you brew it differently for cask versus brewing it for keg? I, 
I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. I just <laughs> put it in a cake. <laughs> <laughs> just don't do it. Um, and and you know, is this then a yeast component? Is it that lower carbonic bite that um, that allows that kind of malt sweetness to feel bigger than it otherwise might be? Um, you know, as you think about yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's one of those things. I mean, it's a hopping schedule. It's it's choice of hop, choice of malt. Yeah. Um, and I also think water treatment is a big big part of sure. this, all the beers here. I mean, we treat all the water in a, um, to keep it simple. All the bitters go to Burton-on-Trent and all the black beers, mild included, go to London. Um, water profile. Water, water so profiles. If, we're, you know, if we're doing black beer, the porter uh, will go to London, the stout will go to London, mild, everything else goes to Burton-on-Trent. Um, and what is that, uh, you know, have you tried brewing them without that kind of water profile? What's the difference? I have, yeah. I mean, and I just, I, uh, and I've seen other people do versions of the beer we do here, and have remarked it doesn't quite taste the same. And I think it is their water treatment. I mean, when you, I mean, the only beer that we don't alter the water for here is the, is the Billsner. I mean, because it's now. You know, Denver Water just did t- <laughs> change the pH on us, so um, we might have to look at that one. Uh, this bills that we have here, we brewed before they did that. Yeah. But I think, well, I mean, to keep it simple, I mean, you can get really in depth about this, but really, same thing. Look at what they did. I mean, you want to brew, you want to brew a great bitter. Go to Burton. Yeah, I mean, you know, breweries in London in the 18th and 19th century came to that conclusion. Water's pretty soft in in uh, in London, so they a lot of these breweries just opened Burton breweries. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I keep and I, I I'm drinking this pint incredibly fast. I'm only, already halfway through, and uh, we're in under 10 minutes. Well, that's the other <laughs> thing about cast conditioned beer. You know, we've had people come here and go like, now. Your beer's an awful lot stronger than you say it is. And it's like, well, how'd you figure that then, bruv? And they're like, well, I feel pissed after three pints. And it was like, well, how long did it take you to drink those? How long have you been here? 30 minutes. So that's your answer. If you swallow (laughs) three pints in 30 minutes, yeah, you're going to get pretty drunk. Um, But it is an easy, easy drinking beer. And that's what cast conditioning beer is all about, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really enjoying the kind of aromatic component. We talked a little bit about uh, hops in there, but do you think about the, do you rub hops before you, you throw them in? Are you uh, kind of conceiving of how that's going to translate into the the kind of aromatic and flavor component of the beer? Or is it just so we stick to, um, you know, the, the hops that I know that are going to work well? Uh, mostly, I mean, tried and tested. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we live, are there specific hops growers or, or vendors that you you pull from because they give you uh, exactly what you want in these? Yeah, I mean, um, it's difficult to get the kind of hops that you really. I mean, we're, we're all on pellets here, right? Right. Um, you know, if we if the brewery was in Kent, then we'd probably make you know a different kind of beer. I mean, that's that that's the whole thing. And, if you've ever had a pint of Harvey's from Sussex, that's a whole other thing. Right. But we can't get those kind of hops. We don't... It, it's kind of like, you know, everybody locally experiments with a Harvest ale, you know, a Harvest beer. Sure. Um, and we've made, we've made the chinwag as a Harvest beer, and it's, it's been beautiful, but we can't really justify the money... <laughs> You know, the $1,800 worth of hops you've got to put right, in it to make... Right. I mean, it's a fantastic beer, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, yeah, hops are, hops are a, a big thing, but, but they're mainly... Um, most of my hops come from the UK. I think, they, you know, there's terroir. Right. Uh, not to, I, I, ha, I have had Goldings grown in, in, uh, on the West Coast here, mm-hmm. and they're good. Uh, when you get top quality British hops, I think they're different. I've used both. I've also used Willamette, which I'm, you know, which is pretty close to sure. Mr. Fuggles. Um, 
you know, they're just, they're just, I mean, it's like if you went and talked to beer start, I mean, they use one kind of hop. Yeah. Um, and we're familiar with it. No, and that's, well, it's the, you know, again, we're, we're talking about fine points in rather delicate beers. And, you know, it's interesting when, when we talk to brewers to find a commonality, even with Brewers Bring Pilsner, um, there are specific farms in Germany that a lot of key brewers will all source their, their uh, hops from because that specific terroir from that specific gr- grower grown in that certain way gives them exactly what they want. I'm just, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just interesting to probe into that brewing mind to find uh, where that comes from. Um, maybe we should pivot and talk about uh, the porter next uh you know since that's uh, maybe that's, we should drink one <laughs> we can drink one and you know what one if you pour one then uh, i'll read the next sponsor message all right done looking to start or expand your craft brewery look no further than abe beverage equipment for complete brewing and packaging solutions abe has been a trusted partner for over 1,000 breweries worldwide and is known for their excellent service contact abe today for a quote on a complete brew system at abeequipment.com Abe offers turnkey solutions from 3 to 60 barrel brew houses and canning lines from 15 to 90 cans per minute. Visit abeequipment.com for complete brewery solutions. That's A-B-E equipment.com for complete brewery solutions. Also, Craft Beer and Brewing's all-access subscriptions give you a year of the print and digital editions of the magazine, plus access to our library of video courses, special deep dive email only for all-access subscribers, premium content, and an all-access exclusive merchandise. Go to beerandbrewing.com and click on the subscribe button to join now. So now that we've got pints of uh, Gilpin Black Gold uh, Porter in front of us, uh, talk to me a little bit about how you were inspired by, uh, you know, uh, the creation of this beer, what, uh, fed into it. Um, what were some of the models and historical models that you looked at for it? And what are some of the brewing parameters? Uh, obviously you talked about water and broader profile earlier, but what are some of the ingredient profiles and some of the ways that you might describe how, uh, a proper, uh, English London Porter, uh, should convey? Um, it's soft. I find a lot of black beers that I've tasted in America come with an acrid kind of burnt tire description. Um, and I think that's part of our tradition here is to add hops to everything. But when you have roasted malt and excessive hopping schedules, uh, think it uh, i mean do you remember going back about three or four years ago when everything was black ipa right i fucking hated that beer <laughs> i really did sure sure i mean i never found one that i liked right right i didn't care who brewed it i never liked them and i think but you mean acrid plus bitter didn't uh, do it, it didn't, for you i mean uh, burnt tire came right, to mind right. you know um i think there's a reason that, that style doesn't doesn't exist much anymore yeah great <laughs> And, and when brewers do make it these days, I, they are using what we've since learned about yeast and hops to push a bit of a, you know, more aroma, fruity uh, element to it to kind of counterbalance that, uh, that dark acrid flavor. But Well, this is on that full of juice again. And I, I think the yeast has a real big presence in this beer once again. I think all the beers that we make here mm-hmm. have a big presence of yeast and it's it's a very, very fruity floral yeast. I mean, right. if 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 you if you sex it up, it'll it, you know what I mean. If you stroke it, it'll deliver for you. Um, now you can make an I, you can make a very good American IPA on this. I mean, uh, they're doing that at Westbound. We took this yeast and we took it to Westbound, and Jake. I actually did some research and came back with the idea that you could, you know, I mean, because most American IPAs, it's like, get the yeast out of the way, let's use right. Chico or something, a chew through cardboard and make alcohol. Uh, but there is, there has been a study done that this will actually produce better aroma with New World hops. And it's, well, it's such an interesting thing that, yes, that London Ale 3 yeast has become this driving factor in contemporary hazy 
you know, and fruity IPA, um, you know, and as such a strange thing to see where we've come to now in the world of IPA, which I shouldn't say strange. It's, um, it's actually a, a much nicer place, I think, for uh, IPA to be in, uh, not just focusing on that bitter component, but also looking at all the other ingredients and how, you know, from um, not just hops bitterness, but hops aroma, also looking at yeast contributions and how those can highlight those flavors. Um you know, and so this this current iteration that seems that's very popular that you know in uh, in the United States and now around the world of of haze IPA is really driven by this kind of expressive uh, British yeast. Yeah, I think they're coming back to us. I yeah. mean, the only bit that they haven't done is clean it up yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like I like David's uh, over at uh, Comrade. You know, when he had those hats made, we and we had one on the on the pig for a minute. It was like, what was it? Uh, my, my, oh, make IPA clear again. Yeah, I, was, sure. I, I thought that. Thank you. <laughs> We're only two pints in. It could get rough. Uh oh. Uh oh. Um, and uh, you know your beers aren't aren't uh, you know crystal clear. They're uh, they're not. Well, that one's just been rolled in. Oh, okay. And okay. they are crystal clear. Oh, okay. <laughs> so fuck you. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for uh, for judging you on a on a fresh cask. Yeah, that one. That one. Yeah. Anyway, that's why I asked him if he'd find it, but he didn't. Um, so let's let's get back to talking about this porter. Um, you've got this fruity yeast component that certainly counteracts any of the the sharper edged, you know, dark malt flavors. But when you choose malt for this, and this is also you know a low five percent beer. Um, how do you kind of build that malt body for it? You start with two row, British two row. I mean, you, for me, I mean, yeah. you take your pick. Simpsons is mine. There is no black malt in this, and I think that's that's when I say there's no black malt. There's no black pattern. Right. You know, a lot of people start there. You want to make a black beer, get black pattern. Right. I think that's that acrid version sure, uh, sure. you know i call it burnt tire it just sometimes it's uh, and a lot of people won't drink dark beer and i think that's because it's th- this is very soft it's pretty rounded sure. um it's hopped to about 35 ibus it's not excessive uh it it it's it's for me it's a combination of malt the yeast we use and of course, cast conditioning. <laughs> Get so, that bit right. So, without uh, you know black malt, where do where's the color contribution come from? Chocolate, chocolate malt. Yeah, and, and robar. And what? Robar. Robar. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of percentages do you typically build around? I can't tell you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> we've hit uh, we've hit uh, uh, the proprietary wall there. That's perfectly fine. I appreciate that. Um, you know, this is a big thing for me that you don't get in. And when you say this is a big thing, you're well, holding a glass and we're Belgium lo- lacing. We're looking at an empty glass that is covered with lacing through the glass, and right, so you can see where you've been. You can see you had. Well, this is why you you're getting a bit pissed because you went one, two, three. Now I'll turn your glass around. You went one, two, three, and then you got a bit thirsty. <laughs> and then I finish it off. You can actually see when I drank the beer from the tears of lacing on the glass. Yeah. And that's another thing I love about English style bitters, cast yeah. conditioned beer. It tells you a story. You know, I mean, it, yeah. when it's poured, it looks beautiful. Apart from that one, uh, which you already pointed out wasn't quite quite clear <laughs> sure, or as sure. we say in the in the trade polished <laughs> to accomplish that out of malt you know everyone's using malt in a you know using similar ingredients how do you build that kind of head retention and that kind of rich malt character um you know is it a, a mash strategy or, or are there other techniques that you use in the brew house to kind of um you know, accomplish that with these ingredients? Well, we're pretty tight on the mash. I mean, it's a lot of work. Sure. Liquor to grist, 
traditionally is pretty tight in 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 uh, in the UK. I mean, like again, when we brewed that bill, so I mean, I mean, I always think we fucked up somehow because you know the water, the, the liquor just keeps coming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I think there's a there's a relationship between tight mash and the kind of uh, work that we get back. It's our work, but it's it, it's it's worth it. Um, and these beers, so the the uh, the porter is is um, the strike is pretty high. Um, most of the beers are sort of like 148 the bitters are about 148 to everybody knows this shit 148 to 150 but we go pretty high on this just to relieve a little residual sugar yeah it still attenuates pretty good though huh. i mean we're still at about 70 percent attenuation on this porter and yeah. on the, and on the chin wag about 75 on that um but to leave that just that little bit of Residual sugar just to give it a little body, body and where does, a little In terms of gravity, where does the porter finish up? Uh, the porter? Yeah. About five, five, six. Okay. A- ABV you're talking about? Or uh, gravity? Play-Doh. Uh, the gravity... Sorry, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> what's the, the final gravity? Uh, the final... About 10... 10, 13. 10, actually, 10, between 10, 15 and 10, 13. Okay. I mean, with that much black malt in it, it sometimes, you know, depending on how, if I've been a cheap wanker and sort of like use the yeast a little bit more than I should, it'll finish at about 15, you know? <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit. We're, we're, you know, getting on here a little bit. Um, nice little licorice component to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and obviously that's malt derived, but there's that interaction of yeast and malt that's uh, probably yeah, a lot of people have asked this. me if we put coffee in that yeah i just uh, normally just give them a spanking and throw them out you know <laughs> um are there specific uh malt varieties of uh these darker malts that you really enjoy obviously you're going to say simpsons again i can just guess no no natural fact um, mo- most of um most of the specialty malt in that beer is actually from crisp Okay. Um, I have switched it to Simpsons, and it almost made. I wish I'd have designed that beer on Simpsons, as far as specialty malt, because it is a lot more potent. Um, we've made it on Simpsons malt. Yeah. Nobody else notices, but I've noticed. Yeah. Um, so stick with it. And you're, you're saying the Simpsons malt is a higher performer, but it doesn't quite. You maybe. That higher performance it changes the profile help the beer it, yeah it's not a bad it's, beer it's course, just it's course. just not that one in your glass right um right. and you know the, the big thing that i tried to do here was uh you know when we opened everybody said you can't open a brewery with three beers and i think the answer to that is you can if they're good ones beer start they make three beers and like i said the cats out of the bag right now everybody knows i make three styles of beer i think you're right on that cantillon makes lambic you know yeah yeah and their lambic is you know, some it, of the best in the world dre fontaine and makes lambic like you know it's okay to make a small number of beers if you are highly focused and when i make the beer i love and i invited to come and have a pint that's always been my saying you can't do any better than that if you're not making the beer you love why the fuck are you doing it Amen to that. Uh, let's talk about how you sell this beer to customers. You know, that I think becomes, you know, as I'm thinking about professional brewers who are listening to this, you know, their first reaction is, well, I can't sell a, a beer called ESB because no one wants to buy a beer that's called bitter. And then, and so I have to name it something else, which is what you talked about earlier. And then, you know, the other side of that is, you know, people come and they want a high gravity beer because. You know, it's more bang for their buck, and you're selling a whole bunch of low gravity beer. No, we're not. We sell we sell OBE. Okay. <laughs> we sell a barley wine. I mean, if you want to get okay. if you yeah. want if you yeah. want to get it on, you can get it on there. I mean, we also <laughs> sure, sell sure. a black top, right? Which is you, and know, you can also sell me four of these, which will do the same thing. Yeah, you've only you've had two of those in. Well, you're halfway through the second pint now. I am. I am. 
Um, in, in that regard, like how you know, from a business perspective, how do you build that connection with uh, with consumers? Because you know you're brewing a basically a niche style in uh, in a world of craft beer, where you know it's not a hazy fruity IPA, it's not uh, you know a pastry stout that's filled with a bunch of adjuncts, mm. it's not a kettle soured beer where uh, you know they're pushing you know lactic acid and a whole bunch of fruit in order to push it. This is a uh, you know very traditionally minded, also flavorful but very um, deliberately normal well you can't be all things to all people so you know pick your battle i mean it, it, you know you can either see it as a battle or you can see it as like you know like i've said i brew the beer that i love and i invite it to come out of a pint uh as a business model it sucks but <laughs> you know it's good for the soul <laughs> you know what can i tell you i mean why would you you know why would you i i don't even know i mean i don't really know why i brew beer i couldn't drink or i don't like obviously i'm not a businessman <laughs> <laughs> well maybe that's why uh why people love the beer as much as they do I, you know, I, I guess there's something to being that passionate person brewing something that everyone else is not brewing right now yeah, so if there's anybody out there that's got a spare half a million dollars that I don't want, <laughs> <laughs> don't start a brewery, come here. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So from a, a broader perspective, um, what does success look like for you and for Hogshead Brewery? Mm. Success. Well, I've never had an ambition to seem be at the Zimbabwe. Um or anywhere else, actually. Go back to that whole thing of uh, beer doesn't travel. Uh, Central Brewery, tied houses. That's an old British term that just meant, basically, you were fullers and you had 250 pubs across London. Uh, This version would be locally brewed beer, serve locally, own your own property, I'm too old to be uh, thinking about sort of like, you know, well, let's, let's get it right. I mean, the, the last Breckenridge sailed, right? I mean, I can't really believe that, that the big guys really want to buy too many of us again. They certainly don't want to buy this because they don't understand cast conditioned beer. Um, so, and, and, to, and to make cast conditioned beer and serve it at, at its optimum, you need to control the whole thing. Uh, which is brew the beer, sell the beer, train the people that sell the beer and serve it, you know, multiple outlets that you can control. You know, putting beer in a keg and selling, sending it halfway across the country kind of works. Well, it works, but not for me. How important is that connection, direct connection to your customer and the feedback that you get directly from them? Well, it's, it's really important. This is one of the only breweries in Colorado where when people will come in and say, what's drinking well today? I mean, you walk into a normal brewery or boozer, as we say, or whatever you want to call that, you walk into a normal pub, you know, the, this is what Budweiser and Coors built their name on. It always tastes the same. There's an art in that. I mean, you know, the, the very smart people make beer like that. The nuances and the idiosyncrasies of beer are in a cast condition beer for me. I mean, the beer travels. Day one, when, it's, when that firkin goes on, to day four. We very rarely have a, day, uh, have a beer m- more than four days old. But because it doesn't have any ex- extraneous CO2, the beer will change. There are small nuances. Some people like a beer day three or four. If you've got a bigger beer on, like a barley wine, that's a whole other thing. I mean, they will pick up some sort of oxidisation there's a word that in American brewing, oxidization doesn't even belong. You know, when a beer starts controlled oxidization, new new flavors come out. And, you know, when you've got a beer of a, a nine of one of those big beers that you were talking about, we don't brew. Uh, 
the big beer, the window liquor, they will travel. They will. Tra- I mean, some di- sometimes sure. they'll 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 last a week, um, and they will pick up some of those Madeira sherry flavors. You know, we all know when a beer's oxidized, right? Right. But cask conditioned beer is 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 a very special thing. It's an environment where that oxidation process happens in a much shorter time frame, but beers live a, a rich life over this shorter period of several days versus this long term you know, multi-year cellaring beer kind of... Uh, well, everybody here in America is interested in having beer that's not older than 45 days or something, right, you right. know, because we're, we're, you know, and there's a, there's a reason for that. We're selling keg beer yeah. that's all about aroma and hop. Yeah. Going back to the IPA as a cast condition beer, when that hop can settle down with the yeast and the malt... I believe that's a, a, an interesting component also. For sure, for sure. I think that's a great place to end this. Nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. HS1228 Hops are third in the new BSG Hop Solutions portfolio. Brewmation brings nearly 20 years of innovation and experience to the world of brewing. Spike is born out of a basement in Milwaukee. Abe Beverage Equipment is your complete brewing and packaging solution, and Craft Beer and Brewing's All Access subscriptions are the best way to support this podcast. Uh, Stephen Kirby, Hogshead Brewery here in Denver. If people want to learn more about Hogshead, where do they find you? <laughs> At the brewery. At the brewery. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for joining coming for in, this mate. conversation about uh, about brewing uh, craft beer, uh, about cascales and uh, traditional English styles. Yeah, it's nice to see that somebody interviews me can swallow a pint as well. Well, I'm going to polish off this one in the next couple minutes or so. Uh, cheers. Cheers, bro. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.